Hello YouTube, Dave here again. Today I'm going to be sharing my thoughts on the Call of the Netherdeep campaign, a critical role licensed product, tie-in product I guess you could say, uh, and the newest adventure for D&D 5th edition. Uh, this campaign is designed for a group of players starting at 3rd level and going all the way up to 12th level, uh, reaching 13th level once they complete the final encounter of the campaign. Uh, before I get into it, I just want to be clear that this book was sent to me by Wizards of the Coast for the purposes of doing a review of, so I do want to thank them for that. However, they are not paying me for this, they're not influencing the video, and the opinions that I express are, as always, 100% completely and totally my own. Uh, this was a campaign that I really wasn't so sure about when it was first announced. Uh, I have to admit I'm not uh, into Critical Role. Uh, I've tried watching the, the gameplay videos a few times, and I've just never really been able to get into it. Um, I haven't really been interested in the animated series or any of that stuff, unfortunately. Um, but... I have nothing against it, right? I'm not one of those people that is, you know, anti-critical role. It's just not for me, and that's fine. Uh, and in the past, um, like the critical role of the Wildmont campaign setting, uh, I have to freely admit was not my favorite campaign setting book that they put out for 5th edition. And uh, so I was a little bit concerned about what I was going to think of this book. Um, and to be honest, it is kind of difficult sometimes to discuss anything critical role related. Uh, because it is a very uh, polarizing subject within the gaming community. And I'm not really looking to get into all that. All I will say is, you know, it's it's fine for what it is. If you love it, if you like it, that's great. If you don't, that's your personal choice. That's fine. Uh, just be respectful in the comments because it's it's a game. You know, it's not life or death. We don't need to get, like, super worked up over something that's just, you know, more or less meant to be fun. And, uh, you know, Critical Role is not hurting anything. You know, it's it's a great way for people that aren't uh, aware of D&D. &D. Uh, it's brought people in that way. And I think it's done some good things for the hobby. So you just relax. You know, you know, we'll just try to get through this video. But, um, you know, I want to just be clear that I'm not versed in Critical Role lore. Uh, and uh, that was something, again, it usually gives me a little bit of a unique perspective when it comes to some of these, like, licensed kind of uh, products. Because I can sort of look at them and try to determine, like, how good is this for people that aren't a fan of the, the license or the property that it's sort of uh, referencing, right? So how, how good is this book or how easy is this adventure going to be to run for people that aren't into Critical Role? And that's something I'll address as we sort of go through here. Uh, now, I also want to say I'm going to try to keep this as spoiler light as possible. Um, I will probably do a video in the future that goes into a little bit more detail, or I may do another, like, uh, campaign ranking video where I, you know, feel a bit freer to discuss some of the more spoilerific stuff, uh, in the, uh, in the book. But for now, uh, cause I know that there are people that are gonna, that might watch this that, um, aren't necessarily going to be running it. <laughs> so I want to try to keep it as spoiler light as possible, but there's going to be some mild spoilers. So just keep that in mind. If you are a player and you know, you're going to be playing through this campaign, I do ask just out of respect for your dungeon master who spends, you know, a lot of their personal time getting ready to run your games. Just please don't, you know, look up spoilers for the adventure. I've played with players that do that kind of thing and it's not fun. So just you know, if you're not, if you're going to be a player, I ask that you hold off on watching this video until you've gone through it or, you know, um, or just, you know, you can let your DM know if you're interested in the idea, um, they can look at the video and maybe it'll help them decide if they want to run it or not. So, but like, so I'm going to try to keep it spoiler light. Um, you know, I'll talk about some of the early stuff because it's the early stuff and it's things that you're going to be aware of from the very beginning of basically the first session or so of the campaign. But as you know, I'll try to keep the end stuff, um, you know, sort of spoiler free as much as possible. Again, there's going to be some here, but uh, yeah, let's just sort of get into it here. So the first part of the book is essentially background information. And this was a part that I was really relieved uh, to see in here. And I have to say, it does a really, really good job of giving you all the information that you need to be able to run this campaign and sort of know the locations, know the backstories, know what's sort of going on here. Uh, this section of the book also uh, gives you the information on, I don't necessarily want to use the term villain, but the uh, the final encounter, the individual um, that 
the final encounter uh, is comprised of, uh, you actually get a decent inf amount of information from their background. And like, so I'm not going to go into it here, but I will say that this individual um, is probably one of the more well-developed and fleshed out and interesting um, final encounter uh, in one of these like campaign setting or campaign books, not campaign setting, but campaign books. Um, I was just really engrossed by the background information on this individual. And uh, yeah, it was just, again, really, really well done, in my opinion. Uh, one of the more interesting final encounters, we'll say. Uh, this campaign also uses the milestone uh, advancement system. So it sort of tells you uh, at what point should the players reach certain levels. Again, you begin the campaign at, at third level and you finish the campaign at 12th, gaining 13th, essentially at the very end of the, uh, of the campaign itself. Uh, let's just skip ahead. I'll come back to this section here in a moment. It also gives you some cool information on like character creation, session zero, uh, a pronunciation guide, which I will probably forget right away. So uh, if I mispronounce something, even if it's in this section, just relax. I'm recording this at like two in the morning. So, you know, like just, you know, it just be cool. Right? <laughs> just, you know, I understand I get stuff wrong, um, but it is what it is. Uh, anyway, the campaign begins with the player characters going to a um, a town or sort of a collection of villages, whatever you want to call it, called Jigao for uh, an event called the Festival of Merit. Now, the players are going specifically to participate in this festival where they go through. There's several uh, events that they go through, and there are definitely some interesting stuff. So there's like a, a pie eating contest. So the, the events are meant to test different aspects of your character. So there could be like your physical hardiness, your um, reasoning logic, uh, you know, sort of other like physical attributes. It's a kind of a cool eclectic uh, mix of things that you have to sort of do here. Um, or you don't have to, but you're, you know, the players are there to participate in these events. One of the great things about this section here, because this isn't, this isn't the first campaign, um, that's had sort of these games, you could call them, these events that sort of take place at the beginning. Uh, and there's, it's kind of a theme of the campaign that it takes elements from other previously published adventures um, but incorporates them and sort of makes them their own for this particular adventure. And I'll touch on that subject again, sort of uh, in the, you know, my opinion portion of the video here. But um, during these uh, different events, there are uh, NPCs that actually comprise another adventuring party that um, serve as sort of, the term that they use is rivals, right? And, you know, it's right there, right? That these are that these are like rival adventurers, but the nature of your relationship with these NPCs uh, actually is dictated on how the players conduct themselves and how they interact with these NPCs during these events that take place during the Festival of Merit. So the, the, the rivals could be like a friendly rivalry if the players are courteous, if they um, you know, show basically like moral, you know, integrity as they go through, like they, they don't cheat, even though the possibility is there, um, that, you know, they just are friendly, they're not, you know, conceited or anything like that. If they conduct themselves in a respectful manner towards these NPCs from this rival group, then the rivalry is more of a friendly one, where the two groups can easily work together if the situation calls for it later on down the line. Um, you could have sort of a more neutral um, uh, relationship where, you know, they there's no real underlying animosity, there's no friendship. It's just, you know, they're two different groups whose goals may align or they may conflict, and that can sort of dictate how things go throughout the campaign. Or you could create a hostile rivalry from the beginning if the players are abrasive, if they, you know, if they cheat, if they do sort of all these different things. Um, so it's actually a really cool section because the events themselves, they seem like they're going to be fun to run. Um, they're simple, but there's more to them than the Wild Beyond the Witchlight uh, events. Um, uh, you know, and if you succeed, if you're the winner of one of these events, you get these medals from each of the different ones. And the medals can be used as a one-time, like, magic item. That can give you like either a bonus to a skill check or you can re-roll a skill check. 
or saving throw or something along those lines. But if you succeed at them and you get one of these medals, they actually can have a mechanical benefit, even if it's just a single, like, one-time use, and then it becomes just, a, you know, an inert, uh, mundane item. But again, it's just a cool integration, and I love the fact that the this early section is the catalyst for determining how the rival group views the players as you progress uh, through the campaign. Uh, going through these events just sort of lets the festival organizers, I guess you could say, uh, get an idea for which individuals, uh, which adventuring groups uh, are the most worthy to participate in the final contest, which is a race through a location known as the Emerald Grotto in order to find um, a medallion or like an amulet um, that's located somewhere within the caves. Uh, the first group to actually collect this, uh, this trinket um, actually receive a vision uh, from this individual who, this voice they kind of hear um, begging them to release the, the individual that they're trapped, that they're, you know, if they're basically like in a dark place um, and they're, like, they're, they're, dis they're being disturbed and they, they want to be freed. Right. Um, the other, uh, the other adventuring group, um, they kind of, they get a flash of that, but instead of being able to hear things clearly the way that the group that takes possession of this amulet does, um, they hear the voice distorted as if it's like deep underwater. So it's sort of, both groups will become aware that there's something going on, but the group that takes possession of the amulet is not only declared to be the, you know, the chosen heroes, um, to, you know, undergo this quest to actually awaken more of the latent power within this medallion, um, but also the ones that is chosen by this, you know, this trapped individual hoping to have those heroes come and release them from their prison sort of idea. Um, so that's the, that's sort of the beginning section here. And it's, again, it's a really cool section. I really do enjoy it. The rest of the campaign is the players going through different locations, like I said, to awaken the power of the uh, of the um, amulet, to learn of its connection to a location known as the Nether Deep, and that the Nether Deep is a sort of a demi plane that can only be accessed through a recently rediscovered set of submerged ruins underneath of a different city. Um, but to get to those submerged ruins, to get into the Nether Deep. Um, there are factions working within the city above the ruins um, that will try to enlist the player character's aid and helping them secure um, the Nether Deep because the Nether Deep is the source of an element called Ruidium. Uh, now, Ruidium is this, you know, sort of material, crystalline material, I guess you could say, uh, but it actually can, like, it can incorporate itself into really anything. So, um, like, uh, inanimate objects or items can be affected by it, as well as living sentient creatures or even magic items can be corrupted by this stuff. Uh, Ruidium grants abilities, it grants powers, um, it allows you to enter the nether deep and survive the crushing water pressure that would normally be present there. So there's a reason for you needing to have um, some contact with the element in order to actually harvest or mine the element, um, but it's something that can also, it corrupts you and slowly takes you over and uh, kind of corrupts you to the point where it can become fatal. Uh, but it's it's sort of like, so it's an interesting, you know, device that the, the players have to sort of contend with in the later stages of the campaign. Uh, they need, but they need some of these items and they need the help of one of these you know, three different factions uh, in order to enter the Nether Deep so that they can finally, you know, confront um, the voice that's been calling out to them throughout the campaign and uh, decide what to do with it. Do they free the trapped individual? Do they, do they you know, redeem the trapped individual? Or do they fall in combat to the trapped individual? Possibly. Um, again, sorry, there are some mild spoilers here. Uh, and what's really cool about this campaign, I have to say, is the fact that um, there are multiple endings uh, actually written into... The campaign itself. So depending on how the player characters, um, how they, what they do in that final encounter dictates whether they get the bad ending, where essentially they just release this hostile force into the world, uh, the neutral ending where that force is destroyed, or the good ending where that force actually can be redeemed and um, can sort of regain 
um, come back to the side of good, I guess you can say. It's a little hokey, I guess, the way that I said it, uh, but it is actually a really cool uh, section of the uh, of the adventure. And the last thing with the Nether Deep, to actually reach and to get through the heart of the Nether Deep to where this individual is imprisoned, uh, the players have to take on um, aspects. What are the, uh, oh, I, the, the term the term escapes me here. Just for a second, hold on. Right, so yeah, to actually be able to enter the heart of the, the Nether Deep, uh, the players, as they're exploring it, they can encounter these what are called fragments of suffering. So it's kind of a bit of a bummer, sort of a, a darker tone uh, to the later half of the campaign. Uh, but these fragments actually have mechanical benefits, mechanical drawbacks, but they're essentially you have to sort of take on some of the, um, again, the suffering that this trapped individual has been enduring for who knows how long in order to actually be able to have the opportunity to free them uh, or destroy them or, again, fall in combat to them. But again, it's another cool sort of section of the uh, of the campaign. So, again, I don't, I'm not, I don't want to get into necessarily what each one does specifically, but it is, again, a really cool uh, section of the, uh, the campaign. And, yeah, like I said, I, I, I want to try to keep it a spoiler light as possible there were certain things that i did feel like i had to mention just a little bit um to sort of give you an idea of some of the things that the players will do they you know they investigate certain ruins um they uh bring life back into this you know mysterious amulet they have to sort of deal with the ruidium and the corruption that it can create and find a way to put a stop to that as well as you know this voice that keeps calling out to them Overall, it's a really cool campaign. Um, it's one of, I have to say, it's one of the better campaigns I think Wizards of the Coast has done for 5th edition so far. Like I said, I do want to do a more in-depth like, like story review uh, or overview going into like the different locations that the players go to, uh, stuff like that. But for now, I just want to keep it a little bit vague and just sort of give you my ideas, my, my thoughts as I was going through and uh, reading this. Like I said, it's one of the more interesting campaigns that I think uh, Wizards of the Coast has put out in a very, very long time. Uh, number one, I love the idea of the rivals. Uh, and I've always been a fan of having rival adventurers that the players interact with throughout different points of the campaign. It's not a new concept for published D&D adventures. In fact, the Strixhaven uh, campaign also had uh, a group of rivals, but they were kind of more on the periphery of the adventure. Uh, they were there, they were sort of more of like minor pests or antagonists. They weren't really a major part of the campaign, but the rivals in this campaign um, are some of the best I've ever seen in terms of their personalities, their backgrounds, uh, but just the fact that they're incorporated really, really well into the campaign. Uh, and you can actually, as they go through and as they progress, there's because you go through, like, uh, you start with, like, you know, Tier 1, which is levels 1 through 5. You start at 3rd level. You go into Tier 2, which is levels 6 through 10. And then you get into Tier 3. Uh, the NPCs also uh, go through that kind of progression. So there's different sets of stats for them as they go through. But each different tier that they go through, so Tier 2 and Tier 3, there's real actual character development with these NPCs. Like, they don't just... Um, exists in a sort of like static uh, relationship with the players, things that like they experience things, you know, things happen to them. Um, they grow, they are sort of, you know, they, they start off a bit more like wide eyed and optimistic, but you know, by the end of the campaign, uh, they've experienced some things that have sort of left them hardened. Um, I'm not going to say uh, like broken down, um, but they're kind of, it's, it's, They've gone through enough things that they kind of become more like macabre or morose as they sort of develop. Um, and it's just really, really well written. Uh, they're also integrated, like I said, superbly throughout the campaign. Uh, they appear regularly. There's logical reasons why they keep appearing throughout the different parts of the uh, of the campaign. And they're just one of the best parts of this book, uh, I will say. The, the one downside is, um, and this campaign book does try to come up with different possibilities, different, you know, events, different sequences of events that can possibly take place. So um, the player, the, the heroes are chosen by whoever first takes possession of this medallion in the, those emerald caves. 
And there is a chance, albeit an unlikely chance, but there is a chance that one of the NPCs from the rival adventuring group could be the first one to grab it, claim it, experience the, the vision or hear the voice, and be declared as the chosen heroes uh, and go throughout the rest of the campaign. And it's it's cool that they incorporate that, like they try to plan for what if like the players are hesitant to uh, to a fault as well when it comes time to retrieve this uh, this relic that they can feel this latent magical energy coming through. Um, so it's 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 cool that they try to plan for the possibility, but at the same time, you know, if the if the NPCs, if they're the ones that become the chosen heroes, then the player characters essentially take a back seat. Uh, so it's 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 cool that they plan for that but at the same time i would really highly recommend as much as possible not allowing that to happen because at that point it is somewhat difficult to keep the players motivated to go through the rest of the events in the campaign it's not impossible but they're they go from being the focus to being the foils for these NPCs that are now like the chosen heroes. Again, it's a highly unlikely thing because even if the NPCs get there first, the book does sort of say that because they can feel this latent magical energy um, that they're hesitant to touch it. And uh, let's be truthful here. Like how many groups doesn't have at least one person who will just casually, like while everybody else is exercising caution, will just brazenly stroll right up ahead and grab whatever thing it is that people are sort of being cautious of, right? I, I mean, let, like, how many groups don't have one of those players? You know, let's be fair, right? Uh, so it is highly unlikely, but it is a possibility, and if it does happen, it really can sort of throw a wrench in the works, so I would recommend trying to avoid that possibility. But other than that, like, the NPC's involvement is really amazing throughout this book. Like I said, they, they can, you know, and the nature of their interactions it depends on how the players acted early on or sort of as the campaign goes on. So there is one point where uh, the the players and the, the rival groups uh, sort of, you know, uh, come into contact with each other. Um, you know, one group was hired by this NPC to sort of escort them through these ruins. And um, when they discovered the player characters, like, you know, they're ordered to fight each other. And if the rivals, if the rival group is friendly to the player characters, then like that sort of prevents that combat from happening. And then this NPC is suddenly like, oh crap, I don't have backup anymore. What do I do? And, you know, the, then there's a really cool sort of escape sequence uh, planned out that, you know, you can sort of go through and the players can try to stop and prevent. It's just like I said, the, the campaign, I think, does a really good job of um, trying to come up with um, contingencies for, for different decisions that have to be made throughout the course of the campaign. And that comes right down to the finale of the campaign. Like the players really do have to make a choice in the end uh, when it comes to this final encounter. Like how do they how do they interact with it? What do they do? Do they just try to take it out? Do they try to, you know, restore it um, back to, you know, the side of light? Or like, what do they do, right? It's, it's actually a really cool section, uh, the choice that they have to make. And again, there's multiple endings based off of that. Uh, I don't want to get too much into like spoiler territory with the final encounter, uh, but I will say that the final encounter does go through um, different phases, different forms with different, you know, attributes and hit points and abilities. And it's not, again, that's not a new thing to um, the like, fifth edition campaigns. Rhyme of the Frost Maiden had the same thing with the Frost Maiden. She had three different forms that you could have that you had to fight. Uh, when you were confronting the Frost Maiden, but the forms here actually make more sense. Like the Frost Maiden being this divine being and having these different forms that you just go through, it was cool, but it wasn't as logically explained uh, as it is here. Right here, it actually is a major like there's a major reason for it. It's a logical reason for it, and it's a really cool section again of the uh, of the campaign. So there's just a lot of really cool stuff I have to say in here. Uh, there's a lot of concepts from other adventures that have been released, but they're all done, in my opinion, in a much better way. Uh, even coming down to joining one of the three factions, right? You're not necessarily going up 
like directly against the other competing factions. There is some interaction between different groups though, but uh, it reminds me of like joining a group back in Waterdeep Dragon Heist, but instead of it just being like, you know, a single skill check that you have to make uh, during downtime activity, like you actually get a sequence of cool missions to go on um, to reach the point with this organization that they'll trust you uh, with what needs to be done in order to enter the nether deep, which is the player's goal, like sort of from the beginning. So like I said, just overall, it's a really well-written campaign as far as the aquatic, uh, encounters and aquatic combat and sections of this campaign are concerned. Uh, I was worried that they were going to be overused in this campaign, uh, especially since, you know, a lot of the videos sort of discussing it talked about like aquatic stuff, or at least the ones that I watched a little bit of. I do try to avoid like spoiler stuff when I know I'm going to be reviewing a book or, or getting it to go through on my own. But uh, I will say the, the campaign gives you the tools that you need um, to deal with the aquatic sections and that they're reserved for like the end of the campaign. So it's like the more climactic uh, portion of the campaign where you actually have to deal with the aquatic stuff. It's not all throughout. Uh, thankfully, so it's something that it's cool. There's a novelty to it as you're going through it. There's a reason for it, and it's building towards like the climax of the campaign, as opposed to being something that's just overly used throughout the entirety of it to the point where it becomes more of an annoyance than you know, a, a, like a cool section to go through. So I like the restraint that they showed in not having like you know almost the entire you know campaign or like the biggest you know the majority of it take place underwater. They did a really good job with that. I also like the fact that in order to be able to deal with like the water pressure and uh, being able to enter this aquatic domain that the players have to, uh, for the most part, they have to um, risk the corruption of this ruidium element uh, that can sort of like slowly like take them over and slowly like zap their, their, their life force from them. Uh, as you become more and more corrupted by the ruidium, you gain levels of exhaustion, and if you reach like levels, was it six of exhaustion, you're dead. So it's it's kind of a risk reward thing, but it's a cool section nonetheless, and I think it's interesting to uh, to involve it. It's again the rhodium stuff could have been really overdone, uh, but I think that they actually do it pretty well. Uh, the the rhodium honestly kind of reminds me of red lyrium from like Dragon Age Inquisition. <laughs> Uh, I don't know why, um, I, you know, it's just, but it, it, it reminds me of that. So there's just, going through this book, there are just so many things that I see. It's like, okay, well, that reminds me of this or that or, you know, these other things. But it's just done really, really well. So overall, I think that this is a, a fantastic campaign. The only real complaint that I have with it is the fact that the, the level range, once again, just doesn't quite match up with the scope of what you're trying to do here. Uh, in fact, um, like the, the word epic, uh, where is it? Uh, it's right here. Like it's referred to as like an epic critical role campaign. And like the scope of what you're doing is pretty big, right? I'm not going to argue uh, with that. But when it comes to D&D, the word epic kind of has its own connotation. And like being 12th level when you're going through the final section of the campaign and dealing with, you know, a creature with the background that it has and the abilities that it should have and all that stuff. I really wish that we would have a higher level range, like maybe start at fifth um, and go from like fifth to 15th or 15th or fifth to 17th or just, I don't know, something. It's just like 12th level. It's fine. Um, and I will say, I understand fully why D and D fifth edition campaign books? Why they focus on levels like one through ten or one through like twelve, thirteen? You know, sort of those 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 level ranges. Uh, it's because those are the most popular ones for um, Adventures League, and just based on a lot of like surveys and feedback, you know, a lot of like the bread and butter of uh, D and D campaigns seems to be like from you know levels one through like ten. And then once you get to level 10, you kind of want to get to like the climactic part because after about 13th, 14th level, um, things can kind of break down. Uh, I don't think 5th edition is quite as bad of, uh, for that as like 3rd edition was back in the day. But I understand the concept of levels like 1 through 10 really being the most popular, most commonly run uh, levels for campaigns. So I get I get the business reason why having um, this for like a lower level range 
um, even though it's like, you know, an epic campaign. Uh, I get that, but at the same time, you know, it would be nice uh, if we had more options for like the higher level play. Uh, I think that this going to 15th level would have been great, you know, and that would have been fine. Uh, based on the types of endings, you could have a situation where the players, you know, you might want to have a few levels of progression uh, for them to sort of deal with the fallout if they get the bad ending, we'll say. Um, but yeah, I don't know, it's just one of those things, right? And it's it's it becomes the self-fulfilling prophecy. It's like, you know, yeah, levels 1 through 10 are the most popular ones, so we're going to write for that. You know, those that's going to be the focus of our books. But then, you know, those might be the most popular levels because that's all that they're writing stuff for. So, you know, is it that nobody really plays like tier three, tier four uh, adventures as much? Or is it just the fact that they don't have a ton of the options for it? So, yeah, they, they're going to play the lower levels because that's what's out there. I don't know. I would have liked to have seen a little bit more of a higher level range, but that's a minor gripe. And truthfully, like I said, this is probably one of the best written adventures that I've seen from 5th edition uh, Wizards of the Coast uh, in quite some time. Uh, I wouldn't say it's necessarily my favorite, but I would definitely put it in the top three. And just from like background, like the background development, uh, character development of non-player characters, it's the best one I think that they've done so far. Uh, it's definitely worth checking out. And uh, like I said, I will do a more in-depth video in the future. If I forget or if I get sidelined or sidetracked and, and whatever, uh, if, like, say I'm recording this on uh, at the end of March, if by the end of April I haven't done that video yet, please let me know and I will get back to it. Uh, you know, usually my intention is to come back to something, but I get so much other stuff that I have to work on that I kind of lose track of things. So I do want to do a more in-depth uh, video, but for now... Uh, it's like I said, the, the, the background and history is really well written. The campaign book gives you all the stuff that you need to run it. So if you're not familiar with Critical Role, if you're not familiar with the Wildmont campaign setting or, um, you know, the world that Critical Role exists in, um, this gives you everything that you need uh, in order to, to still run it and do it competently and comfortably and confidently. So it's really well done from that perspective. I love the rival NPCs. I love their character development as they progress through the campaign the same way that the players do. Um, I like the fact that, you know, there is sort of a, a, a theme of, especially towards the end, you get sort of a darker feel uh, to this campaign than some of the other ones that we've had come out. Um, I like the darker stuff, like Rhyme of, Rhyme of the Frost Maiden is, you know, one of my favorite uh, campaigns, and that has some darker elements to it, and this one is kind of the same way. It's just, again, really, really well done. Uh, definitely recommend checking it out. Uh, do so at your local game store if you have one. Uh, this, yeah, like I said, it's, it's a good adventure. Um, I think it's one of, like I said, it's one of the better ones that they put out. Uh, I love the fact that it's also a campaign that ties into a previously released campaign setting. Even if it's not my favorite campaign setting, and even if it's one of my least favorite campaign settings for 5th edition, I love the fact that we actually have something that connects to a previously released campaign book. I would love to see them do something similar for Ravnica, uh, for Eberron. Um, there's, you know, in all likelihood, we're going to have a Dragonlance campaign setting, something which I've kind of speculated on for a while now. Uh, so it would be great if they just released a campaign book that tied into the campaign setting. Um, I don't know if they will, if you know, for things like Eberron or not, but, you know, if it's anything like this one, I think it would be a great thing if they do it. But yeah, just again, awesome stuff. Uh, definitely worth, uh, definitely worth checking out. Like I said, my only minor nitpicks, uh, the fact that uh, the level range just, again, doesn't quite meet up with what the, the what you do in the campaign but that's a problem that fifth edition adventures have had for years now so this isn't unique to that book right by any stretch of the imagination and truthfully i think it would be pretty easy to scale this up for higher levels if you wanted to so it's definitely not that big of a deal um the npcs are well incorporated the only thing like i said i, I would highly recommend against creating the scenario where the npc rivals become the chosen heroes and then the player characters, you have to figure out how to keep them going with the campaign. It's cool that it's in there. It's cool that they, you know, uh, allow for something like that. But it's the least desirable way to run this book, in my opinion. But those are really the only two things I can honestly think of. Other than that, this is a very solid product, a very solid adventure. 
Um, very interesting one, great background, one of the more compelling uh, final encounters uh, for any of the D&D campaigns that have come out in the last few years. Um, you know, great NPCs that actually do grow and, you know, uh, progress as the players do. Just a great book overall. And uh, again, I highly recommend checking it out. So thanks again to Wizards of the Coast for sending this to me. Thank you for anyone that's taken time out of your day to watch this video. And like I said, if you want me to go into more detail, I will try to do that uh, in a few weeks time. But for now, I just wanted to get out my my opinions, my thoughts on the on the uh, on the book as a whole um, without going too deep into spoilers because again by the time I recreate a more spoiler heavy uh, video that goes into the specifics you know it'll be a point where for the most part if people are going to be running this campaign they probably would have started it by now so the people that might unscrupulously look for like heavy spoilers or you know to get like a uh, a really in-depth plot summary you know they'll have to get it elsewhere right anyway again thank you guys very much i really do appreciate it and uh, i will see you all next time take care